Okay, so we're talking about uh, the formed elements of blood today, specifically some counts for the cells. Like how many red blood cells did you have in a given amount of blood? This page is 109 <clears throat> to maybe, we might get through clotting today. And then next week on Tuesday, I'll do the little blood typing lab I have for you. I'll wait till everybody's here. So Elizabeth gets to be in on it. It's kind of fun. It is fun. Okay. I left that up there for y'all to review or to just remind yourselves of what we talked about. Any questions or anything like housekeeping stuff? Just, I'm sure y'all got signed in today. Uh, I've started Liberty, I'm trying to get a hold of them, and um, the rest of y'all are right behind, so everything is kosher there, too. I should have more info for you next week after Tuesday. Give me some good, good attention for a few minutes. I won't, I won't um, keep you too long today, but it's quality over quantity today. So formed elements, you don't have to know these by heart, but you should have a general idea of where things lie. And you can always view it on, usually on every lab exam um, results you have. Do you all have a copy of uh, some lab results? I think I gave you like a hematology study a long time ago. Look through your stuff for me. If not, I can go dig it up. <clears throat> Lexus, look at this picture on page 107, 108 for me. Tell me how much of your blood is formed elements. 45%. If you can't find it, it's no, no problem. So 45% of all of your blood is physical solid cells formed elements. The other half is what? Can anybody raise their hand and tell me? Plasma. Plasma, correct, very good. Plasma is about 90% water. So of this, 99% of all these cells are gonna be RBCs. That's the majority of them. And it makes sense because they have to carry oxygen and nutrients and waste to and from away from our cells, so we need a lot of them to do that. Very important to remember, okay, in my opinion, that an RBC will live about 120 days. That's the average lifespan for a red blood cell. Why is that important? Has anybody ever heard of the test, your A1C? hemoglobin A1C for diabetics. Like they'll check my A1C. Sweet. Yeah, just keep that out. I'll copy it in here a minute if I have to. That's a test that diabetics will get and they'll have a number and it'll be good or bad, but it tells, the, it tells them how their diet and sugar content has been over the past three months. Okay. And it makes sense because red blood cells last 120 days. So if you remember, a red blood cell has those hemoglobin molecules on top that bind oxygen and carbon dioxide. If your blood is way oversaturated with glucose because you're a diabetic, this will become glycolated or it'll have glucose stuck to it. And we can look at these cells and do a ratio of young ones to old ones or something in that nature, how many are glycolated or have glucose stuck to them and how many are new and don't and get that hemoglobin A1C number that we depend on to tell diabetics how they're doing for the past three months. So that's a, that's a very common blood test and it's a hematology study. What's your um, results there, the chemistry or hematology?
What's some of the results you got? I think that's hemat hematology. That may not be on there, but you'll see things like hemoglobin slash hematocrit. <clears throat> Let me just go copy that for you. Okay, so back to red blood cells. Let me tell you a couple more things about these. After that 120 days is up or whenever they, their, your body decides to recycle those red blood cells, they're broken down. Some of the byproducts are called bilirubin. Okay, <clears throat> it says here that RBC destruction results in three major breakdown products, iron, amino acids, and bilirubin. Iron and amino acids are recycled, but bilirubin is transported to the liver and then probably excreted mostly in your fecal matter. So if you have a sick liver, you probably have a buildup of bilirubin in your blood. It's not being processed and excreted. That condition where bilirubin builds up in your skin and causes you to have a yellow tint is called jaundice. Uh, John, John Smith, jaundice. Does everybody know what I'm talking about with that word? Maybe people with liver disease, not necessarily alcoholics, but alcoholics, it's a hallmark for them. You'll even see the, the whites in their eyes become yellow sometimes with people with liver issues. Newborn babies, their liver is often immature still, and so the bilirubin is backing up, and they'll be jaundiced, and they'll have to go into their UV light in the newborn ward on the hospital. Like the, so bilirubin is degraded or broken down by UV light. And that's why we put them under that blue light for newborn. That's degraded, broken down by UV light. My son Henry wasn't sick enough to need the UV light. They let us go home, but the doctor said, put him by the window for a couple hours, get some sunlight on him and then come back and see me in three days and check his hemoglobin again and his blood count, and it was fine. That was enough for him. So why is that important to you? When you take a blood sample that's going to be testing for bilirubin, you have to protect that sample from light. So you're either going to put it in like an amber-colored tube that blocks light, or you're going to wrap it in tinfoil like the picture in your book shows you in a couple chapters forward. It's tinfoil-covered thing in there, okay? So keep that in mind. It's a test and uh, a specimen handling question for you on your certi cert certification exam. Handling specimens. Under RBC blood cells. Here we go. That stands for micro liter. It's equivalent to a length measurement like in the micro meter that you all just did on your M&M quiz. Not mill equivalent, but micrometer. So there's like a million microliters in a liter. And two liters make like a Pepsi bottle, just to give you an idea. All right, so in one microliter is what all these numbers are gonna be referring to. In one microliter of your blood, <clears throat> it's about five million five to six million RBCs. Typically men have more on average than women because our body sizes are bigger, we have more blood volume. How many liters of blood do we typically have in our body? Let me get a guess. How much can you leak out before you quit working? Page 107 will tell you five to six liters of blood. OK. 
Okay, I probably should have started out with that, but you contain about five to six liters of blood total in your body. Difference between sexes and body size. All right, any questions about that? Everybody can kind of remember a hemoglobin, bilirubin, A1C, red blood cells, five to six million. You're, you're probably never gonna have to know what a normal RBC count is. You should just be familiar with it, especially in your training, and then every lab will have their own reference to say, oh, this is low or this is high, and flag it to alert the doctor and the patients. Uh, RBCs on here, their normal range is, um, let's see, what did they put? For an adult, four to five million RBCs per milli microliter. All right, the next one is white blood cells. I won't bother writing out the leukocytes anymore, since you, unless you all want me to. They're much less uh, in volume. You, about 10, I'm just gonna say 11,000 per microliter. And that makes sense because you got white blood cells floating around in your blood, and then if one of them is alerted or triggered because of a pathogen, then many more white blood cells will come out of your lymphatic system and start to work on it. They'll be more present. So if I take Zach's blood and his white blood cell count is elevated, that's going to give me a clue as to he might have an infection. Okay. If it's low, then it's something like leukopenia, and that's a type of cancer that I, I don't know enough to talk about on right this second, but there's different conditions we'll name. <clears throat> okay, so much smaller number. If you see a large amount, that's indicative of infection. The next one and almost last one, we'll come back to some of these specific white blood cells in your book. Uh, it's 100,000. Give you the right information the first time. Page 110. About 200,000 per UL. These are also known as platelets. Okay, so there's one, two, three numbers, maybe even four, <laughs> that you want to be familiar with. Get down. Now, with regards to all these specific white blood cells, like granulocytes and neutrophils, I'm not going to test you on those specifically in my class. You just want to at least read what your book states about them. It's just a little more detail than we need to cover right this minute, I believe. So I usually kind of gloss over that. But there's some neat stuff, like you can see on page 110, there's a horseshoe there's a cell with a horseshoe-shaped nucleus that's kind of unique. And cells that have these little granules show up, like in item C on page 110. That's called a granulocyte. They have granules in them. And then there's A granulocytes, meaning without, that little A on the front, like A fibro, if you think back to A terms. <clears throat> okay, natural B cell or natural killer cells, B cells, T cells. I'll give you another little uh, blip on that uh, at the end of the chapter, okay? Any questions about that? You can see the red blood cells for sure. The little pink things are platelets in this clot. This white string we're getting ready to learn about is called fibrin. Okay, I want you all to look at 112 here. I'm gonna give her my book, so I want you to help me out, okay? Should be looking at page 
111 and 112 for a minute. Hemostasis. There's another H word. Maybe it's already on our list, I'm not sure. That means blood being still, right? The process of that uh, happening is called coagulation. And you've talked about anticoagulants and coagulants in our additives. That's what I was trying to get. These are phases. So the vessel will be injury or injured. Doesn't matter if it's a vein or an artery, okay? Arteries tend to spasm more. They have more um, muscle in those than veins because arteries are deep. They're carrying blood, they're vital. And if one of those is broken or bleeding, they need to stem the flow quickly or we're gonna bleed out. So once it's injured, cells will release their contents, which will signal other cells, hey, time to contract. And it's like a histamine response. Like you get an allergy, cells will start releasing stuff to, to fight that and get mucus and get it out. You start just snotting and tearing. It's sort of like a cascading effect. <clears throat> All right, those same chemical messengers that are released from the broken cells of the vessel will start to signal platelets. And the first thing that happens is that platelets, um, we'll say adhesion, I think. They get sticky, start sticking to each other. This is platelets I'm talking about here. And then the more and more of those that pile up, they, they have a secondary phase, which will be called the aggregation phase. Platelet aggregation. So platelets get sticky, and then basically platelets pile up at the side of injury. This one's where it gets a little tricky. This is where you need to give it some more detail. So you can refer to this chart on the, the next page, 112. You want to be flipping back and forth as we're looking at this. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to remember intrinsic and common pathways. I'm going to ask you to remember a couple of these factors here. It's called the clotting cascade because one thing has to happen before another and in sequence, but when it does, it just amplifies and, and gets worse and worse. More and more clotting happens until the stimulus is removed. It's a positive feedback mechanism, if you all remember way back in the day from chapter six or one. Okay. So you got prothrombin turning into thrombin. <clears throat> And then thrombin works to make fibrinogen into fibrin. These are enzymes in your blood. These are the clotting factors we've been talking about that's in plasma the whole time. Okay? And when there's a clot, they're used up, and so it's just serum left over. So prothrombin, it precedes or is before or promotes the formation of thrombin. Turns into thrombin. These are important terms to remember, okay? And thrombin is a pretty common term. Thrombus, thrombosis, clot. If I'm not mistaken, thrombin will work towards activating this fibrinogen, okay? Genesis, it's generating fibrin, the final product we're looking for here. 
and it goes towards making fiber. And that is this monomer, this fine filament here. It's like a chemistry experiment. You ever seen an experiment where they'll have some clear liquid and they'll tap it or drop something in and it'll start to crystallize out of nowhere? That's called like precipitation. This will precipitate when the right chemicals are activated and together. And so platelets will do some more stuff in there and start to contract and pull this fiber net together and pull the, the vessel injury together so that it can heal. So it'll be like a contraction phase that's outside of our wheelhouse. But that's what those platelets are serving as something for that fibrinogen to pull on and close up that wound, whether it's microscopic in a capillary or in a big artery. Did I miss any of them here for this one? Under coagulation phase? Okay, last, last phase here then. Fibrinolysis. So the lysis or the cutting of fibrin. We had this clot made that you see on the picture right there. We have to get rid of that because it can't hang out there. So some of this is useful, some of it's not. I think FDPs can lead to a test that is common for, for women in pregnancy that are having problems. <clears throat> That's fiber and degradation products. I'll let you read that. But just remember, it's referring to pregnancy there. What I'm more interested in is tissue plasminogen activator. I think it's done like that, TPA or, help me out, Brittany. TPA? Mm -hmm. Which activates plasminogen, right? And so we're kind of going back to that plasmin phase. It's the way I remember it. It may not be correct, but plasma with the clotting factors, then it's serum without the clotting factors. We need to go back to plasma, like homeostasis, back to the starting point. This is significant because only up until maybe six to eight years ago, this was a rare medicine that was kind of new. It's what you know as the clot buster. So if you're having a stroke symptoms, or if you're having a stroke or symptoms of a stroke, and it's within a certain time frame, you get to the ER, now a nurse practitioner can push this drug. We just bottled it up to break clots, to bust clots up. Um, so within a certain time frame, we can push that and see dramatic recovery and symptoms of stroke and stuff like that, breaking that clot up. Okay, so TPA, clot buster, clot buster. Any questions about that? I kind of summarized it pretty quickly, but you need to make sure you go back and, and study that, okay? You can tell me which one of these comes first. Pro comes before thrombin. Genesis comes before the actual product. Those are my hints. Okay. Um, Stop there on that.